Welcome to another episode of the Masters of Sport. I'm here with my co-host, Earl Kunkel, also co-author of the Sports Performance Bible Strength and Conditioning Guide to help you conquer and create dreams for all of your athletes. And, oh, there's a picture of Aiden on the back, too. We didn't talk about that. Oh, nice. Great picture, Aiden. You know, another D1 athlete that's on there. Where's he going? Uh, he's only a junior, but he, he oh. just got offered by a Temple. Nice. Dude, you know what? I wanted to tell you one thing quick okay. before we get into this. Uh, so at, when Nick got the, the Gatorade Player of the Year, they wanted me to roast him and talk about, like, uh, oh, Dane, tell stories about Nicholas. And I didn't want to do it because I knew I'd cry like a bitch. But the... No, you wouldn't. Yeah, I would have, dude. Wow, you really thought I was serious there? <laughs> You asshole. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Man, they should have had me come roast them. I probably could have did a better job. Than me. No, so, but they, I don't know them that well. But, so they're, <laughs> so they're like asking me to do this. I was like, no, nah, I wouldn't be able to keep my shit together. Um, but I, I think the when I was driving home, I was thinking, why couldn't I do that? You know, why, could, why, would, I, why would I do this? Why would I break down and lose it? And I think what, what it goes back to is that when you're training people, or when you're when you're like guiding people in some crazy journey or whatever, it becomes so much about the experience and the development of the individual. And if you have somebody from day one, you know, as a as a leader, you have this vision, right? You have this big time vision here, and then you have somebody here who's willing to drop their ego at an early age and be like, I'm gonna listen to everything you say, and I'm gonna come along, and I'm gonna plot Get along, and I'll do everything, and we'll piece together this huge string of events that ends up being this crazy outcome. And then as, as the, the coach, you're like, dude, they did it. They did everything they were supposed to do. That's freaking phenomenal. And it's like, I, how do I tear that apart? Well, yeah, and it's like, for me, for me, like, I was like, oh, what am I going to tell a story of, oh, Nick, you have 330 pounds in your, in your house, in your gym, we're training on a Zoom call, I need you to front squat it for five, clean it, and then front squat it, okay, I'll do it, Nick, uh, Saquon Barkley bench 405, okay, I'll do that, and can we try that in, like, two weeks, bench is 405 on a fat bar. <laughs> Yeah, that's my story. Sorry, like I have nothing. To, I can't roast him. He's too nice. <laughs> yeah. all, all he does oh, is oh, he's super polite too, yeah. man. And he'll just be like Dane, like shut up sometimes. Yeah. Wow, what an upstate. He'll do you always say that about me? <laughs> what a great person. Yeah. Oh man. I think the meanest thing I've ever heard him say or I do hope it was to you. No, it was about Jason. Oh. He's wanted to see Jason's fail on the hurdle. He thinks it's like the funniest thing ever. <laughs> He's like, Not as I've funny never. As that meme of Jason running up to the million subscribers. <laughs> the million subscriber memes better. <laughs> but that's like the meanest thing he's ever done where, where he, he'll be like, yeah. I can't believe he did that. It's like, dude, Let people. Let me laugh at someone falling. Yeah, people fall on hurdles all the time. Like, yeah. But yeah, yeah that, I just wanted to go on a little rant. Hurdles, there. though. You jump over hurdles, right? Yes. And I was thinking about jumping. Yeah. I, I was, seriously. This is, we're going to talk about jumping. And I was thinking about... So can we insert Jason's hurdle <laughs> hop here? I think he actually made us money on TikTok with that. Good job, Jason. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> no, no, that one, that one uh, like, funny or die or fails, like... Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't think they ever used it because they never paid us. Uh yeah, we were signing a contract for that video. Where is it? No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's facts, too. 100% facts. Oh, burn. burn. <laughs> yeah, F you. You should have brought Jason along to roast Nick. <laughs> yeah. Yo, Nick, until you sign that NIL, eat this. <laughs> Everybody's like, dude, that escalated quickly. Yeah. <laughs> what can we say? It gets hot in here. <laughs> oh, man. Back to jumping. Jumping, hurdles, not falling over them. Yeah. All right, so what sport? And you can't say, like, the triple jump, the long jump, or high jump. Okay, so I'm shackled. Yeah. Is, like, jumping, like... Volleyball. All right, you're right. Basketball. Basketball is probably another one. But, all right, let's get rid of those five. Okay, basketball, volleyball, out. Yeah. 
what are the sports where it's like, dude, you, you got to be able to jump, like, in some capacity? I mean, right off the top of my head, football, you got to jump. When, though? No. Like, Especially a lineman. Like, lineman typically like going for, like, a block or something, Yeah, right? yeah. Soccer? Yeah, yeah wide receivers, D-backs, so. though. I, I would say goalies specifically. Yo, I feel like D-backs need more baseball skills than anyone Give Probably credit for like, yes. Go that, play the outfield, make yeah, it happen. I agree. But I, I, going back to that, I'd say uh, goalies. Um, goalies need to jump. Explain yourself. I'm on skates. This isn't figure skating. What's going on here? Okay, so if I'm a soccer goalie. Oh, I'm thinking hockey, dude. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would also say though, like you skiers. see goalie, I see the mask. Yeah. Jason Voorhees. Oh uh, yeah. I also think skiers, though. Skiers have okay. to jump quite a bit. So it's it's like... You went there. Man. You take it yeah, out. that's that's where I'm like trying to think. Um, I, I, I would say, but going back to the discussion, the sport in a whole would be, to me, the most would be football. Because linemen, wide receivers, running backs, D-backs, linebackers all have to jump. Uh, I would say goalies have to do it the most per action in their sport. Um, you know, like if you think about a goalie's action on the right, field, right. It's, they're probably jumping 50% of the time. I'm sure we could watch a couple of games and yeah, figure no, that, that out. That makes sense. Um, and then, you know, if you, if you watch like handball, they jump from the line all the time when they're shooting. Um, do you consider the crow hop like, or like when the bowlers like, yeah, that would be a, that yeah, yeah, that would be a, jump. yeah, same with baseball too. Yeah. But I think, I think, I, I still, dude, I still think it would probably be football. All right. Now we're going to let basketball and volleyball back in. Okay. Is the max effort more important or the, a bit, the endurance to do it repeatedly more important? For, for volleyball, I would think, <sighs> If they're, I mean, they're in five game series. It's gonna be, it's gonna be volleyball endurance. Okay. Uh, you know, if you have, if you've got a, let's say you have a thirty five inch vertical versus a thirty two inch vertical, but I can handle my thirty two inch you for can hold it longer. holding it longer. Yeah. Well, then that that's definitely. What about not even just holding it? The amount of deterioration from like your floor to your ceiling too. Yeah, it's minimal if you have the endurance. Right. I think I think with with football, it would probably be endurance based as well because it's a long game, yeah. dude. The games are sixty minutes. Dude, it's fourteen minutes. It just takes sixty minutes to watch it. <laughs> <Yeah>. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> like one of the greatest things that ever happened for my like audience is finding. Uh, an NFL video on the NFL YouTube oh, channel. Oh my God! That's and they the basically show you ever. every single Dude, catch, first down in, in ten minutes. Yeah. it is the I've watched more football in the last eight months than ever in my on life. That. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. is so awesome. It's so quick. It's like why couldn't all games be like this? And I only have to deal with like a fifteen-second ad at yeah. the beginning, and then maybe one in the middle, maybe. And I might be able to skip it six seconds in too. <laughs> yeah, oh. uh, no, that's act. That's very accurate. It's wonderful. Speaking of ads, anyway. <laughs> no. I, 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 I still think, though, uh, with, uh, with the... Being in basketball, it's got to be endurance Endurance. Based. Yeah. Yeah, because it's very rare you, like, you get that breakaway where it's like, yo, show off. Yeah. Make it happen. Yeah. And I even think of someone like Dennis Rodman, who was like... I, I loved Dennis Rodman when I was a young kid. Like... Michael Jordan's on the Bulls. I'm like, I like Dennis Rodman more. Yeah, he's more like the yeah. crazy. But, like, he get rebounds, and he never looked like he was jumping higher than everybody. But he positioned himself well. Yeah, it was all his body. And he would keep jumping until it was his. Yeah. And yeah, he he knew how to use his body yeah. well. Especially for, there was, like, three years. Probably his last year with the Pistons and then two or three years with the Bulls where, like, he was Dude, unbeatable with he was, rebounds. Legit when he was with the Spurs, too. Yeah, true. Not as long, though. He was still... He was unreal. Yeah. Him at... Another 90s person... I know this is sidetracked, but we were talking about basketball. Robert Ory must have more rings. Oh, he or was... Or have been... Like, he was a, a center? Coach, he was like a... 
he was like a, I want to say like a power three almost. Like okay. he could drain it, but he was like bigger, like defensively, like he could play in the post there, I think. Yeah. If I remember, I swear, any team that went to the NBA finals. He was on their team. From the 90s to like the early 2000s, yeah. he was on one of the teams. <laughs> Whether it was like the Lakers. Just, the, yeah, the just happened to be like, there. They were like, oh. We want to win a championship. Who do we surround him with? It was like, well, we need Robert Ory. Like, <laughs> yeah. And he was just there playing. And I could be totally like, this is just anecdotal, but I'm sure if I went and like looked at he stuff, has a handful. like, it's there somewhere. Jason should be looking this up right now. Yeah. But he's not listening. Come on, stat guy. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're talking about jumping in sports. Yeah. And like, Besides the three I eliminated and the two I said, all right, uh, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of sports where we're like, go ahead and jump. I'm sure there's more. And yeah. like, we're just two people thinking of them up now. Right. But to my knowledge, and I want to share a little story too then, every single sport benefits from plyometric training and jumping. Yes. It, it, every single one. Like, if you can point, maybe rock climbing doesn't, but I'm probably wrong too. Yeah, but you even if you're doing it. plyometric with your upper body. All right. And still, still you use your legs when you're climbing. Yeah. So here's my silly story. So young me, like young, like teenager. 17. Younger. 14. Maybe a little younger. 23 years ago. How old was No, 14 was younger than that, I think, right? No, my math's bad. You're 37. No, I'm older than you. You're 38 now? Yeah. When was your birthday? July, like every year. Holy shit, you're Man. 38? It's all right. I don't have as many grays as you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not balding as much as you. You're balding a little, though. Not as much. That's you're said, thinning. You're more thinning. Yeah. <laughs> you're like the slow burn bald. <laughs> <laughs> I was like full steam ahead. Yeah. All right, so I started... I, I got I started like I bought some program off like some magazine. Dude, that, I can tell you which one I bought. That would make you Vertical Jump Bible. That's some, not what I bought. Uh Kelly uh, I got those shoes with like the Oh, raised, I remember those. And they had jump programs in yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And I would go down the like local like little league field and I'd do them in there and my mom would come down with me cuz I needed stuff timed and she'd sit there and like time me and be like, "All right, rest." Yeah. I get to high school and I was like, I was never, like, the strength coach there developed some strong athletes. You know, because one of them came here and he can squat a ton. Oh, AJ, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah he's like, good, yeah. He, he got strong athletes. Yeah. But, like, I was never, like, strong. Like, I could never really express my strength right. through lifting. Like, it, it's just, it's the same reason why I could yeah, snatch almost as much as I could. You're a pathetic human being. People who are like you oh are just, goodness. they're pathetic humans. You can believe that. <laughs> I'm going to disagree. I'm not that pathetic. I'm here with you. That makes you pathetic then, too. You associate with my patheticness. Yes. Anyway, I would leg press. I, I just, like, I wouldn't squat often. But I would do plyometrics, jump boxes, all the time. Yeah. Like, I loved it. Now, I was decent. I, I was never great. Right. But I was pretty fast for, like, 200-pound high school athlete. Yeah. But You I, went to play at Bucknell. You couldn't have been pathetic. I, I wasn't that good. Yeah, but you couldn't have been that bad either. Well, like I said, I was kind of fast on, on the field. Like, yeah. I could express my strength. Through you might not speed. have been the best technical player, but you, were, yeah. you had good physical attributes. I did. That's why as a... Adult, you could decided. snatch 129. I, n I didn't snatch it though, I missed it every time I took it. 27. Yes, <laughs> I did do that one. And I've hit 26 in comp too. Yeah, so there you go. At my latest body weight. I weighed in. Former not American record holder in the snatch. Yeah, 2019 Masters National Champ. Wait until I start wearing the medal. <laughs> Me and Kurt Angle. <laughs> His WWE career, I'm just not going to plummet like him into <laughs> oh, shit. decadence. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. That's a good redemption story. Yeah. You ever need a redemption story, just start doing bad yeah. things for your body. Oh, geez, yeah. I'm sorry we went down that way. Anyway, jumping, plyometrics. Yeah. I never was strong, but plyometrics got me strong. And I know your boy, Bosch, likes to say, you can get really strong just jumping. Yeah. And I know you have your differences with that, but I also know you use plyometrics with a lot. every single athlete yeah, all the time. Like, you find 
their sport and how a plyometric can help them and which one. Right. So why are plyometrics, the, I guess my bottom line is, why is it absolutely like the one of the greatest training ways to do things? I think the, the first way that I like to think about it is looking at it through, if you get, okay, so instead of taking someone like you who's just pathetically weak, let's Whatever. take somebody who's extremely strong. Some, like Sam? No, like take, Jake? Th think, think, no, okay, so for the or audience, like, think about a power lifter who okay. can back squat 650. Okay. Or the, like high school kid, 500 pound back squatter, but he throws the shot 40 feet. You know, he's slow off the line as a D lineman. He can't, he can, yeah, <laughs> he, he can barely jump, you know, he can barely touch the bottom of the net, but he could squat 500 pounds. So your first premonition might be like, oh, well, he's so strong, he's slow. But in reality, what, what's happening is that he's never learned the skill behind force absorption or creating force, and so he hasn't, he hasn't taken those uh, coordination skills that he's used for maximal strength and applied it in learning. And his body is also adept, is not as good at coordinating rapidly so genetically, he's probably not as talented and ta as talented speed-wise. What were you gonna say? I was gonna say, has he not learned the synonym for his kinesthetic vocabulary? No. All right. So he that needs yeah. to get a thesaurus. Yeah, and he needs to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so the the reason why I think plyometrics, and, and I think this is also proven out. I mean, it, it's they should be called power metrics, if you ask me, um, and, and if we refer to them in that you know mindset they they teach the human body how to generate power or absorb power um, subconsciously or unconsciously so you're tr you're training More bottom your, up yeah you're training your body to so there's skills right so the, the skill is if, if let's let's just at first for simpleton's sake okay people like me okay perfect <clears throat> For me to think, I need to cut left here to avoid this defender. It, let's just say, it takes me a second to think here and to get my body to do that. Someone like Barry Sanders can do that in 0.2 seconds without even thinking. He's, he's subconsciously aware of what's going on and, and his body can create uh, power and, and, and coordinate rapidly in these different movement patterns because he's trained himself through these, these different movement patterns in drills, in practice, um, in, in running sprints. Now, Barry Sanders was also absurdly strong. He could back squat 600 plus pounds, but he also trained the skill of, of getting your body to react with, um, with like things like co-contractions are skillful aspects that your body has to learn. So that's where the plyometric base comes in to play is that if I use it for, for throwing, we're going to use it for throwing to, to help with awareness, to help with power output and speed for sure. But it, it's not as imperative in a sport like throwing as it is in a sport like football or, okay. or basketball or even volleyball, even though volleyball is not as difficult from a coordinative perspective. But that's why they're so good, is that it's, it's training your body how to operate with cutting your brain off. It's, efferent, it's efferent. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no efferent, e-efferent. Yeah. You know, there, or there, yeah, there's, it's, it's literally just your body reacting to what it has to your do. Your clutch and shift is yeah. pretty legit. Yeah, exactly. So it's like you're, you're, the control, the manual control is not, from the from the from the person is 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 out of yeah, it's, it's an like, out of body it's really like your shortcut keys yeah verse instead of like oh let me go click file yeah save this and and that's Copy. where that's where you know the best running backs or the best basketball players um, or whatever sport that that's especially open skilled is that they're doing things in training that are so um, variable based that they have to train their body to do that. And, and, and like, even if you watch somebody in basketball do like, like cross somebody over, mm -hmm. like they're, they're not walking, some, some of them might walk in and be like, I'm gonna take one step here, cross them over, 
and and cut back this yeah. way. But oftentimes it's a feel. They're not even aware that they're doing it mentally. They're just doing it as because they've been trained to do that. Yeah, they've done it Repetition, before. Repetition reps. Right, and Over. their body just executes it. And it's the same with a fighter. Uh, an MMA guy is not. Very rarely are they thinking like one two one two three. You know, but they've done that combo so much that their body's in tune they just with. Start throwing it. Keeps yeah, going they, it up. That's yeah, the and then it, and then it connects, and then they do it again, and they do it again, and they do it. They do it again, but it's it's a it's like a not an unconscious but a subconscious uh, means of performance, and that's where plyos I think come into play. And when you're practicing them, you're typically conscious when you're executing it. But then by the last, like, let's say you do six sets, by the last two or three sets, you're just doing it. Yeah. All right. Body's just firing. All right. So plyos creates this neural drive is what I'm hearing there. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Your body can communicate. It's almost, it, it, I don't want to say it, it doesn't have to go back to the central CPU. Everything has its things outside and it knows how to react and think and perform its part to make things happen. Yeah. Let me pitch a theory here. Okay. And I hope we can cut this out of, of this video and in 10 years we can use this on Instagram. But I believe, um, so so one thing is what we're realizing is that essentially now muscles are being looked at as organs. Because muscles have myokines and, and they respond to things like in a local manner and we never thought that this, we always thought that like different organs were communicating to then go heal a muscle. But what's actually happening is the muscle's healing itself through a uh, release of myokines. And this goes back to my whole talk with Julie, uh, with Armstrong, Dr. Armstrong. If we He's go- He's Canadian, right? Yeah. Now if we come back, I believe there's going to be some type of neurological understanding, and this goes back to our relative and absolute strength, people are going to figure that aspect out at some point and there's going to be some neural uh, advancement in medicine that shows us that, that the muscles and, and the muscle spindles and the GTO can actually communicate uh, intra or intermuscularly. So it's okay. like, so it's like you're doing like your body's doing things that you don't know. Yeah, it's almost like, uh, I think, uh, uh, what is it? What is it called? In the Adams family, the just the hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Walking it, along, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of that. Like yeah. it's that yes, idea. It's, like, it's, 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 you could segment it, and like the forearm's still gonna function, yeah. if you will. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. So I think that will come about. It's just we haven't gotten there yet. But we have to get better science. <laughs> I mean, we're pretty good. All right. If you want to accept, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. All right. Well. All right, so we know we're going to use plyos. Like, if yeah. you're not, like, get on board, dude. It's like 1800s, they're already using them. Yeah, yeah. Boxes, hurdles, like, why do I use those? Why do I use one over the other? Why do I use both of them together? I mean, sometimes it's just ease of access. I think some people struggle to have access to hurdles. I, I, I think hurdles have a better play as far as um, an obstacle. Some people just raise their knees into a box instead of raising their hip height. Uh, it's the same problem at, sometimes with hurdles, but you're very likely to raise your hip height because of like the fear behind it. Um, but I also just think, you know, both are useful. I think boxes are really useful, for, especially for younger kids, but then also boxes are good for unilateral you know, drills as well. So it's like, I think they're all applicable. All right, you brought up unilateral. so. When do I do unilateral? When do I do bilateral? How do I combine them? I, do I, I buy it. Like, is unilateral more important than the bilateral? And does it depend? I on... think it depends on the sport. Okay. I think I think for me, I sort of like to do just like a one to one ratio to keep it as simple as possible when I'm writing a program. But often I'll go a, a bilateral movement, a unilateral movement. A bilateral movement, a unilateral side movement. Okay. So I try to like go ba just back and forth to keep it as easy as possible. Do you ever do the bilateral stuff and more the omnidirectional like joystick type movements, or yeah. is that okay? Well, that's more advanced though. Yeah, you gotta you gotta earn the 
yeah. pay the cost. To yeah. Get there. And I think, too, that's where when you start to – somebody like Nick who might have his hip issues, um, you, this is where we're going to be going with, with therapy. And we've talked about this in the past. Reflexive strength training is going to be used for – uh, impingements and stuff like that and, and reflexive strength training coupled with plyometric work is is really good it's a very good way to train your body to like I'll use my example my right side is essentially like totally lost when I'm doing something uh, unilateral to a specific to this to my right side essentially yeah the stability is not there but within two or three sets it feels perfectly normal and if I did that every single day, all the time, in six months, it would probably go completely washed out right. of my system. And that's where I think we're going to be going uh, with with plyometric usage and and reflexive strength with, with so therapies. You bring that up, and my mind immediately went to, like, contrast training. Yeah. But it's not contrast. It'd be contrast. They're more it, similar, aren't they? Like, the speed of the movements? No, I would say reflex is, is shorter okay. or, or slower, slower, slower. And I was trying to think, well, what's the word to describe that? It would be a, it would be. Like, what type of training is that? It would that be a contrast, doing? but it would just be a different form. Man, your branding right now is. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. It would be like the. Uh, You're going to figure that one out, buddy. Yeah, it's like, uh, what could you call that? What kind of contrast? You don't have to do it right now. Yeah, now we gotta, you're, now you're going to lose sleep about this one now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, good. I'm glad. I'm totally I can't wait until I see Jake next week and he tells me. Another way I to brand. You. This is branding, Jason. Yeah. I was going to say, you're not going to sleep until you find another dynamic drum control. Yeah. Your DTC. DTC, <laughs> technical coordination. Yeah. Structural integrity. Dude, I know it's like an episode ago. Training sequencing. But you did come up with the um, expression of strength. Expressions too. of strength. strength. Yeah, that yeah. one. Anterior sequence. Anterior sequence. Thank you. <laughs> Kinesthetic uh, vocabulary. Yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Yeah. And we got all these fancy appendix. Some therapists, terms. some physical therapists are going to get mad at you for that. Which one? The kinesthetic vocabulary. Oh, why? They just might be mad at Oh, that's... whatever. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm a, a lit major that thinks and reads <laughs> books that aren't just fiction. <laughs> like, oh, you're the only one who read that book? Oh, me uh, too. <laughs> oh, you looked at those pictures? Me too. Like, <laughs> you know. Sorry, jumping. All right, this one's going to really irk you. Can an athlete get away with just jumping and not lifting? What's get away with? What, how, what's that defined? Make money. Be a pro. Have they lifted in their past? So, like, you, are you saying all the way up to being pro? Let's say that hypothetically. To start. I think it depends on the sport. If you're seven feet tall, absolutely. Because odds are in favor that 25% of your population is going to the NBA. Yeah. So absolutely they can get away with it. Um, I think... You know, to be the best version, athletic version of yourself, you're st I still believe you're going to have to have some traditional resistance-based training at some point. All right, now flip the switch. When could you start getting away with just jumping? Um, I t it's tough because I, a lot of guys, a lot of women too, when they, when they get to an age like 24 to 27, they'll start, if they, if they increase volume too much in jumps, they get, they'll get knee pain or ankle pain. So the one benefit that I've seen from normal resistance-based training in conjunction with plyometric work, power metric work, whatever you want to call it, is it, it, it helps with the, with the structural integrity you know, around those joints. Are you going to talk about bodybuilding? Yeah. That's the whole thing is, is there's more blood flow to the area if you're under, if you're under you know, have you done experiments yet with like body melting into plyos or vice versa? Like in the same session? Yeah. No, but but from session to session. Okay. Well, good. That leads into my next question. When it comes to programming yeah. the plyos, like in the day, you already told us like uni or bilateral to unilateral and how you do the directions. Whether and based off your skill set, you're either like old school NES D pad controller, or if you're like up and above, you get like PlayStation omnidirectional joystick yeah. controller. And then, but 
that's what you do in the day. What about the week and then maybe like the month? And then how do you sort of see it out to the year? I don't know controllers well enough. All right, so you ever play an NES? Well, no, I, I know those controllers, but right. I... But Have you ever played... Uh, you ever seen a joystick, like an arcade yeah, joystick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. omnidirectional, yeah. right? Like, I can go diagonal. No, I know what your analogy yeah, was, but do you want me to use joystick? Like, do you want me no, to... No, you don't have to use my okay, metaphors. Was... Use your own. Go ahead. I'm uh, pathetic, remember? <laughs> I, I think it... I would just recommend, you know, for a normal person once a week to start and it would typically be, you know, if you're training three days a week, you get a heavy leg day, you do uh, uh, a heavier upper body day, and then you do a plyometric day. Uh, what we do is we'll, right now, what I've seen to be really successful currently based off of our performances and our testing currently, only off of three athletes, but um, we'll do, with our throwers, we'll do a heavy leg day, more of like a a speed bodybuilding day and then for upper body and then on day three we're doing plyometrics and I think when you do you know you have a little bit of fatigue from that heavy leg day and then you do like the bodybuilding upper body day I think your body on that third day has recovered well and from the second day uh, and it's just another way to bring in more speed and then that carries over really well to day four which is going to be more speed based leg work okay so that day three to day four transitions really well. Does that day one potentiate that day three? A I think it bit can. Too? I don't know for sure, but I think it can. Have you tried flipping the upper and lower to see how they do with that less recovery? No, I would have to do that next year. All right. I wasn't sure if you would even think that's worth doing, too. It could beat you up a little where you're too fatigued yeah. going on day four. Or have you ever thought about going with the speed day? prior to the plyo day and seeing how that one might potentially Yeah, I it. thought, yeah, that's a good, that'd, that'd be good. It's just like puzzle pieces. It well, that's the whole like thing. It's like right now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out how's a flywheel piece into a puzzle? How does a velocity-based trainer piece into a puzzle? How are those resistances different? Because right with the Dude, the flywheel like, thing is different because it's just, dude, you feel like you're going to fall. It's, it feels weird. It feels like you're dealing with so a living. So it creates a lot of neural noise is yeah. what I'm hearing. It, it's like you're body. dealing with a, neural, uh, or a live human being the whole time. So then how do you extrapolate that into, because you tell me live human being and I think of wrestling right well, away. It feels, and it's like how do you make that more applicable to what you it need feels to make like, a wrestler stronger? It feels like, okay, so when you're, when you're wrestling someone, you're just constantly dealing with tension, yeah. resistance. It feels that way but with a traditional sport or with a traditional lift. So my thought process is like if I can measure someone's broad or vertical, and I see something, and then I go in and I see, okay, they, they struggle with this quality. I can improve that with the flywheel. Or I can, I can improve the speed of execution by using this as, as a carrot that I'm dangling with the velocity trainer or you know, on a traditional lift and try to come up. I'm trying to piece it all together so I can come up with these little ratios uh -huh. so that when we test people, we can see everything. Do they need traditional? Do they need flywheel thing? Do they need... VBT thing? Do they need all of it? Do they need more plyometric work? Who's your math person? It's Caitlin, isn't it? And Trevor. And Trevor? Yeah. Trevor got that math big brain as well. <laughs> he's not the best, but he's, he sees it. And if I go home and I talk to Caitlin about it, she's like, yo, you can do, like she was who I was talking to last night about spreadsheet. And when I came in this morning, started talking to Trevor and he's like, yeah, that's easy to do. Okay. Yeah. Nice. All right. Jumping. You think I'm not going to math? I didn't say you're not good. I just don't know if you're as good. I'm good at like as Caitlin and Trevor. At like really quick, you know, arithmetic. Yeah, ten times ten. Wow. <laughs> no, but I'm good at like simple arithmetic. That's fast. Have so I Caitlin, told you my favorite number? Uh, uh. I think I have, and you just don't remember. Nineteen? No, not even close. Square root of negative one. Oh, I don't know what that is. It's an imaginary it? number. Oh. <laughs> Dude, I'm dead serious, too. Have you ever heard about the If it's an imaginary number, how is it your favorite number? Because I can make it whatever I want it to be. <laughs> it doesn't quite exist yet. But it's like a mathematical proof for you can conceive of what is in your mind and make it real. 
like it's essentially like to me not being a mathematician yeah it means that math says there is an imaginary world out there that can be brought okay. into mathematics into reality into and reality yeah, yeah so okay. to me it's a almost a, rep a mathematical representation of visualization yeah. and how you can make something become form i think that's what's interesting with math and, and sciences they have that quantum world oh, we really jumped <laughs> Yeah, jumping the shark. <laughs> where are we going with the rest of the jumps? The plyometrics. Ooh, we were just jumping from topic to topic. Yeah. Mental jumping now. <laughs> quantum yeah. yeah. Quantum, quantum leaps. Leap. Yeah. <laughs> Man. I, do you want to wrap it up? Oh, I want to see the questions. You have them there too. Which one do you want to know? Oh, jump series. I asked about programming, getting away with it. I know, I wanted to go into the audience questions. Oh, you want the audience questions? Yeah. All right, yeah, that's easy. 21 Do you like tortoise? tortoise? I don't even know what it is. You don't, it's a, like a his, uh, Mexican. Yes, I like it without meat. <laughs> yeah, with, <laughs> there's no Mexican vegans. <laughs> what? You can just go beans and, I'm not a vegan, but I can go that's just true. beans and that's cheese. Fair. Yeah, that's true. Not yet. How do you get people to listen to you? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was like meta trolling us. Uh, how do you get people to listen to you? Like, how do you get clients to stay consistent in their nutrition and workout? Especially if they're the lazy type. You really try. Um, ah, dude, people, it's just, people can't hold, like, okay. 21 tortoise, this would be my response. The first thing you have to do is, is can you hold yourself accountable enough to, like this is, this is a good example. I, and, and Jason experienced this from the early days of GS. Is like, he didn't show up to training. I don't know, I don't remember if he had a, a cell phone. But even at, at the barn, if Jason didn't show up to training, I was texting him like, why aren't you here? It was expected that he would be at training five to six days a week when he was like 15, 14 years old. And like, I laid like, that was, this is what you're gonna do. And if you don't do it, I'm gonna hound you. I had state champion wrestlers that would go to wrestling practice an hour and a half away, drive back an hour and a half, and then train with me for an hour and a half. And their parents would just be like, how do you get these guys to do it? And be like, dude, cause I'm gonna text them. I wanna know what, what they're doing. And I would even text kids and be like, someone's getting better than you right now. So it's like holding, <laughs> holding people accountable is holding yourself accountable to keep them in check. It's like, if I wanna be the best coach that I can ever be, I need people to help me get there. And they have goals that I can help them achieve. And it's just this, it's a constant feedback loop. My thing I heard from that was, I'm not gonna let their behaviors impact what I can control. Yeah. So like you could control texting them. Yeah. You couldn't necessarily control if they were there. So you did everything in your power all the time. Everything constantly. And relentlessly. And then and as then, you get the success, and now they have to work and then they to know, work with you. Yeah, right? and that and then they know like they have to listen even more so yeah. because it's built in. And then it's even like when they're in the gym, dude, you do what I'm gonna tell you to do, or now now we're at the point where it's like, I mean, even today actually Tavon was like, you know, you, you know like so so Sam said this. I I always say when I turn 40, I'm not gonna meet with people to talk about their kids' training. I'm not gonna do any of that. You're too social. <laughs> <laughs> but say, say, like I said to Sam, what, like, you know, when you make the Olympics, it's gonna be over. I'm gonna tell people what I really think. And Taman brought up today, he's like, you know, I, I like how, how you're, you're getting to be more of a dick. You just say it how it is. You're like one of the, you're like those football coaches, like Bill Belichick screaming at Brady on the sideline, like, this is how I want it done, do it this way. And I think it's important to have that. I think you also do have to have that ability to listen yeah. to, to the people that you that have put in the time and, and have grown. But I think as far as the answer to 21 tortoise, you've got to control yourself as the coach. And that means when you're training them, you, you've got to be off your phone. You've got to understand everything that they're doing and see everything that they're doing, see their reaction and, and call them on, on all their... People always say they want to achieve something but then they don't have the actions to achieve what they want to achieve. And I think that's where I've always held people really accountable is that if you tell me you want to do this and I know the way to get there, 
you better do what right. you're you you better follow along and and execute it the way it has to be executed i wish uh, like Mr. I wish I could figure that out for my workers, though, yeah. for my employees. Mr. 21 Tortoise, I wish he could see you in when the lifters are lifting, like the elite group is lifting, because I have been there with you for, like, conversations going, like, basically writing books, conversations, yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah. And your eyes don't ever make contact with me. Yeah. And I can follow who's about to take a lift and you can look up and your eyes are on them like just zeroing in and i always thought that was one of the things like when you talk about don't be on your phone yeah like and me like i i'm aware enough too like all right conversations ending real quick and like also too depending on where they were at in the lift but even like the warm-ups, like, you know you could talk a little bit more yeah 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 and see things with it and it, it was just i don't know so tortoise what he says, pay attention. <laughs> pay attention, yes. Yeah. Be involved. All right. Last one. Manuel JN. Manuel. Sorry. I, I'm bad at this. <laughs> Hypertrophic, remember? <laughs> I'm really bad at this. I'm sorry, Manuel. I'm bad at that. Do you prescribe warm up lists for every athlete during training, or they go by feeling until they reach the target percentage? Well, first, he doesn't use percentages. <laughs> yeah, that's the. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you prescribe warm-up lists for every athlete during training? Or they, I mean, it depends. Because, like, the throwers, I'm, the throwers, I don't train like the weightlifters. Yeah. The throwers, it's like, here's a blueprint, go do it. You know, we know where we're trying to go. Um, some, you know, I will say, like, you know, like Sam or Taman will come up and be like, Taman today. Lucas, too. What do you want from these behind the neck jerks? Do you want going for broke or do you want just like good speed movement? You know, it's answering that. And then I might lay out like, dude, just hit 160 for eight singles, move it fast, you know, and, and move on. So they know what, what that warm up would look like. Um, they do know that because I have at some point educated them on what that would mean. Yeah. So they have their, they're nearly autonomous. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, I think for, for, you know, if you talk about the weightlifters or younger, like the football guys, okay, so the football guys would be a good example. I will tell, so a good example was yesterday with Nick. Nick, his clean, you know, it was 100 plus pounds almost, 100 pounds more than the other guys. So the other guys, you know, take 70 as a warm-up, take 80 as a warm-up. Nick takes 70. Nick goes on their bar for 80 because I load 110 on his bar. Then he goes on the other guy's bar and takes 90. Then he comes over to his bar and takes 110. So I prescribe that sort of like that platform, that platform, back over here, warm-up. Uh, now, these are high school kids, so right. it's like I will control that because they're younger. There's much more governing. Yeah, going on. there's more controlling going on with that. And I tell them that precise sequencing, and that's one thing I'm learning now. Going back to like my uh, religious studies roots, and and um, and back into like my obsession with Confucianism is like that's one thing I forgot that I really liked is like planning and having these daily rituals for everything that you're doing, and that's where controlling you know controlling a setting like uh, high school football kids, if you have that sequence laid. Warm up, technical coordination, absolute strength, uh, structural integrity, trunk control. That's a workout right there. And everybody knows how long each period lasts, what they're expected. I want to know all your big key like umbrella terms. Yeah. Well, well if you want to know that, yeah, I know. You can pick up this book. Hopefully, it's live on GarageStrength.com right now. Go check that out. Sports Performance Bible. Until next time, guys, thanks for the question, Manuel. Thanks, I prescribe man. warm-up uh, lifts sometimes, depending upon the situation. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 you and that figurine. <laughs>